Welcome to the MedWire News Podcast. In this edition, we are going to find out how the gut microbiome might affect response to immunotherapy. Three articles in Science, published over the past 18 months or so, have shed light on this relationship. And we spoke to the lead author of one of these studies, Jennifer Wargo, from the MD Anderson Cancer Center in the USA, to get her insights. We know that in our bodies we have over 100 trillion microbes, including bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And these microbes actually outnumber our own normal cells by up to 10 to 1. Now, the largest proportion of these microbes are actually in the gut or the gastrointestinal tract, where they serve a number of different functions. We know that these microbes can help with digestion, but also, importantly, we've really come to an understanding over the past several years that these microbes can also contribute to overall health and potentially even to disease. Now, our body actually, our immune system actually originally developed to fight these microbes, but now we know that there's a very delicate balance where these uh, our immune cells are essentially educated by these bacteria and other microbes in the gut and at other places in the body. And so there's a really delicate balance here. And what we've learned from mouse models is that in the setting of cancer, uh, we know that these bacteria and other microbes in the gut can actually influence responses to uh, immunotherapy, specifically to checkpoint blockade, namely uh, antibodies targeting CTLA-4 and uh, PD-1. So there was a seminal paper published several years ago in science. It was published in 2015, uh, two papers actually, one by Laurent Zetvogel and uh, one by Tom Gajewski, that showed that depending on the composition of the gut microbiome in mice, it dictated whether or not these mice responded to treatment with uh, immune checkpoint blockade for melanoma. And furthermore, it also demonstrated that if you change the microbiome, you can actually improve responses to therapy. And so we were quite excited about these findings. So the experiments in mice point to a strong association between the gut microbiome and immunotherapy response. But does this hold true for humans too? We had actually started studying the role of the microbiome in in cancer within the tumor itself, and that was several years ago when I was on faculty at Harvard. And we found that actually bacteria within tumors of patients with cancer can uh, change how they respond to cancer treatment, namely to chemotherapy, by breaking down chemotherapy. But I had seen Dr. Gajewski's work presented at the annual meeting of the Society for the Immunotherapy of Cancer and saw his work on the gut microbiome and how it influenced responses to immunotherapy in mice and was completely floored by the data and got up to the microphone after the talk and asked if they had studied this in patients, and they hadn't, and so saw this as a unique opportunity. And so uh, I am on faculty at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and we uh, see a large number of patients with cancer. And so I uh, went back to MD Anderson, wrote a protocol to collect both oral and gut microbiome samples from patients with cancer, namely metastatic melanoma, who were going on to treatment. And we next profiled the oral and gut microbiome in those patients using a technique called 16S sequencing. And then we compared what we found within these profiles with how patients responded to treatment. Now, we focused on patients treated on anti-PD-1 therapy first because this was the largest proportion of patients uh, in our cohort. And so what we noticed right off the bat is that if patients had a higher diversity of microbes or bacteria and other microbes within their gut microbiome, they actually had better responses to anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. And also, it also depended on the composition of the microbes within their gut, namely patients who had a higher abundance of certain bacteria like Fecalibacteria or Clostridialis or Ruminococcus did much better than patients who had a higher abundance of bacteria such as Bacteroidales. Now we next looked within the tumor of patients and in a subset of patients we were actually able to get biopsies of the tumor before they went on to treatment. And what we found was quite striking, namely depending on what bacteria were in the gut was closely associated with the immune cells in the tumor. And if they had a favorable microbiome with a higher abundance of those good bacteria, like Fecalibacteria, they actually had many more immune cells within their uh, within the tumor that were capable of killing these tumor cells. Okay, so the response to treatment with immunotherapeutic agents does appear to be influenced by the gut microbiome in humans as well. But can this association be exploited to boost the response? Dr. Wago outlines how this may be possible in the future. 
thing that we and others have performed is really to, it's, it is good to make the association between the bacteria in the gut and uh, what's going on in the immune system, both at the level of, uh, you know, the systemic immunity as well as at the level of the tumor. But it's also important to, to see if there's a, a mechanistic connection there. And so we and others also, in addition to doing these correlative studies between the gut and the tumor, um, we also performed studies in germ-free mice where we took fecal samples from either patients who responded or failed to respond to treatment with these immune checkpoint inhibitors, and we performed a fecal microbiota transplant, or FMT, into germ-free mice. And then what we did is we, after performing this transplant, we then looked at the levels of systemic immune markers, and then we also implanted tumors into these mice, and then looked at their ability to reject the tumors as well as response to treatment with immune checkpoint blockade. And it was quite striking. What we found is that if patients received a fecal transplant from a non-responding patient, the tumors grew rapidly and failed to respond to treatment with a checkpoint blockade, whereas if they received a fecal transplant from a responding patient, they either rejected the tumors outright or the tumors grew very slowly, and they had brilliant responses to treatment with anti-PD-1-based therapy. Now, what this suggests is that there's a real link here. And so an obvious next question is, can we actually change the microbiome to enhance responses to cancer treatment, namely to immunotherapy or immune checkpoint blockade? And so we and others are designing clinical trials to test that hypothesis. We are working with the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, as well as Ceres Therapeutics, which is a company based out of Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States. And what we'll be doing is actually taking patients who have metastatic melanoma who are going on to immune checkpoint blockade using anti-PD-1, and we are going to then be treating them with different strategies to change the microbiome. And what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at Number one, are we actually able to change the microbiome? Number two, uh, do, is that associated with a difference in how they respond to treatment? And then we'll be looking at a host of other studies uh, to see how does it affect their immune system, both at the level uh, in the peripheral blood as well as at the level of the tumor, and does it actually increase the likelihood of having a complete response where the tumor goes away completely? Going back to the studies reported in Science, the study by Dr. Wago and colleagues included melanoma patients, while the others focused on patients with other malignancies, such as non-small cell lung cancer and renal cell cancer. Despite the different tumour types, in some ways the findings were remarkably similar, but at the same time, all three studies identified different bacterial species. So we asked Dr. Wago how she thinks these data come together. I think that's an excellent question, and if you look at all three papers, there are some very striking similarities, but there are also striking differences. And so Dr. Gajewski's group looked at a cohort of melanoma patients, and some of the main bacteria that were drivers or putative drivers of response included bifidobacteria. We also looked at melanoma. We saw slightly different bacteria uh, as our top hits, if you will, uh, for driving response to anti-PD-1. And then Dr. Zitvogel looked at uh, patients with either renal cell cancer or non-small cell lung cancer. And she found, again, some very similar bacteria, such as Ruminococcus, but some different bacteria, such as Acromensia, which were associated with response to treatment. Now, the one caveat is that they, there were different techniques used to sequence the samples, and so that can account for some of the variability. There are also geographic differences. I always say that uh, the and influences, if you will. So I always say that the diet in Houston, Texas, is very different than the diet in Chicago versus the diet in Paris, France. And so certainly dietary influences could account for some of that variability. But I also think that it's important for us not to necessarily get too fixated on the different names of the bacteria but what their function is, and it's essentially function over phylogeny. So are these bacteria actually performing, despite having similar or different names, performing the same function and influence on the immune system? So I think there's a lot more studies uh, that need to be done. I think it calls to one point is that we need to harmonize how we are doing these studies and from collection methods on uh, how we're going to be collecting samples, 
to the sequencing methods to uh, pipelines for analysis. Uh, we should work as a worldwide community to really harmonize these efforts. In addition to this, I think uh, we really need to understand other processes within these microbes. Not only do we need to understand the bacteria, but also viruses, and then the influence on metabolism within the gut and also uh, systemically and how that might be influencing the immune system in response to cancer treatment. But I think overall, despite the differences that we're seeing, I think it's, it's very convincing that there is a role for the gut microbiome in response to cancer treatment, and it's only a matter of time before we can start using this to really uh, in the armamentarium against cancer. The studies we have talked about so far have involved PD-1 inhibitors, but what about agents targeting CTLA-4? Does the gut microbiome have an effect on the response to these agents also? So our group and others have actually looked at responses to treatment with anti-CTLA-4 and even to treatment with combined PD, anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4, and there is some overlap between the different bacterial taxa which are associated with response, but there are some differences as well. And interestingly, we also see uh, some bacterial taxa which are associated with toxicity to the treatment, which we know is a problem and uh, can be quite limiting. So I think we'll be seeing those results come out over the next couple of months, but again, I think uh, it, there is uh, there are unifying features to these different microbes within the gut which are definitely influencing immune response and are very likely influencing response to cancer treatment, but we, we do need to do a lot more research. Finally, we asked Dr. Wago if she has any advice for physicians and patients who are intrigued about this research and the possibilities it opens up. One thing, I mean, I think uh, people have asked a lot. There's been a lot of excitement. I think when the mouse studies first came out, there was enthusiasm but some skepticism as to whether or not this could be really playing a role. Now that these studies and patients have come out, and not just the three papers published in Science, but now many other papers have come out showing a role for the gut microbiome in response to cancer treatment. And so I think there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm, but I think it is important that we work together in a very collaborative way worldwide to help answer these questions, both in patients as well as in, in preclinical models. And I also will say that there are a lot of things that influence uh, the microbiome, and, and People are keen to try and change the microbiome. I will say that they have to really proceed with caution, and certainly any patient who has cancer really needs to work closely with their treatment team if they're contemplating any changes to their diet or even use of probiotics. I will say that, that I would uh, proceed with caution on making any major change because it may not help and it could even harm, and so I think people really need to work with their doctors very closely. And on that note of caution, we will sign off. We thank Dr. Wago for guiding us through this fascinating topic and you, our listeners, for tuning in. As mentioned before, the three key papers are published in Science, but do also check out our summary on Medicine Matters Oncology. Until next time. Music.